Welcome everyone to um, the IAB webinar on new and niche publisher and revenue models and digital, driving digital advertising dollars. Um, this is, I think, our 19th or 20th weekly webinar for the IAB. So um, hopefully we're getting a little bit smoother at this, but I'm really, I'm really excited about today's today's uh, webinar. I guess the audience for this one is slightly different than normal. So probably half the audience know the IAB incredibly well. Um, hopefully have sat in on none of our, a number of our webinars. And then we've got some people who are joining us who probably don't normally um, have much interaction with our, with our organisation. So I'm going to do a little bit of a setup. Some of the uh, more sort of close IAB fans will know some of this stuff, but I thought it would be really good to give a bit of context of who we are, why we're doing this, and a little bit on the um, shape of the Australian consumer and advertising landscape at the moment. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Gay Leroy and I'm this, lucky enough to be the CEO of the IAB. Um, so the IAB is the Interactive Advertising Bureau and we um, are a not-for-profit member-based organisation um, and our, our purpose is really to um, support the ad industry, uh, the media industry um, and, and core to our, to our purpose is really um, supporting sustainable and diverse investment in digital advertising across all platforms in Australia. Um, so that's really close to our heart and that diversity angle is both in relation to people within our industry, different media options, different ad models, right across the, across the board. So today's webinar will talk to that in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, we've got a stellar lineup for you today. I'll click through to the people who will be joining us so you can see their smiling faces hopefully there. So we've got a really jam-packed agenda. Um, I'm going to kick off, as I said, with a little bit of background and then I'm going to be joined by Corinne Podger, who is also one of the masterminds of, the, of this event. Corinne and I have been chatting for a year or so on, on running something similar to this. So I'm really, really glad we've been able to, to get it off the ground. Um, and then we're going to have a couple of panels, one that will be looking at sort of the technology and partner side for uh, new and niche publishers. So we've got Simon Lassi from Biztrade, Amy McCormack from ANA Digital and Ben Murray from Interplay, who are really going to give some tips and guidance on, um, I guess, the pragmatic nature of building out an ad supported model and how to make the most of that. And then we're going to come to the sort of publisher focus side of things. Um, we've got Mike Nesbitt from Star News Group, who are expanding their, their reach and seem to be opening a, a title every, every couple of minutes or so. Uh, Stephanie and Antonis from the Financial Standard, which is a uh, specialist financial uh, publisher. And for those who are, um, had seen that we were going to join by Peter Frey, we're, we've kicked Peter out. Uh, he's unfortunately not available today. And we've been joined, we're joined by Will Hayward, who's on the commercial side of private media and a really good understanding of, of different revenue models. So um, that will, that's, that's the lineup for today. If you've got questions as we go along, there's a, there's a Q&A box um, that you can pop them into. We will try and get to as many as we can um, throughout the session. If there are a whole lot that are not answered, we will look at answering them afterwards. This webinar is, all, is a prelude to a handbook that we're working on at the IAB, which is of, of a similar title. And it's, it's really giving all the basics for smaller publishers uh, whether they be new or looking at particular niche areas on understanding how to make the most of an ad supported revenue model, whether that be through uh, presenting audiences, understanding analytics, uh, making sure your, your tech's up to spec, um, data governance, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of areas that will be going into detail. So that publication will come out in a week or so. Um, so we'll let you know when, when that's out, but hopefully that will be a handy resource. So this is just really the beginning. We've got a lot to get through in an hour and I know we won't be able to cover everything off. Really interested to hear from the audience if there are particular topics that we'd like to see covered in the handbook or in future publications, because we really do want to have a, a rich and exciting um, industry. I'd like to sort of think we are, are pragmatic innovation fans. So making sure that we do grow the industry in, in exciting but healthy ways. Okay, a few slides up front for me. Um, look, no surprise to anyone, um, the number of devices and the way that people are um, accessing content is um, expanding constantly. Here's just some daily numbers of different devices. 
on top of that, we've also got smart speakers, a whole lot of different um, areas that people are accessing. We publish a lot of this information up on the IAB website um, regularly, and it's worthwhile if you ever want just an understanding of, of what that landscape looks like, that data's all up there. Obviously, there's been a sh big shift over the last, you know, five, six years to, to mobile um, consumption, but the fastest growing area at the moment is particularly on the connected TV side. At the moment, it's very much focused on sort of YouTube and BVOD video, but that will expand. So constantly looking at different access points. Don't think the internet fridge has ever taken off, but who knows what's next. So keeping, keeping ahead of where your consumers are is incredibly important. In terms of what people are doing online, it's incredibly diverse. And I think sometimes we can feel like everything's dominated in the, in the narrative in market, that it's all very much social and search, but there is a whole lot of content being consumed across a range of um, different areas. So this is looking at some data. We work closely with, with Nielsen to run the currency, and this is looking at sort of category data in terms of how people are spending their time online. So again, this sort of information is up on our website, but understanding what those shifts are. Entertainment is, is a huge one there. Obviously, there's a lot of gaming within that, um, a lot of video consumption, but you know, a huge range of different other areas. I'll be really interested to see um, in coming months how that sort of shop, shopping and commerce side has grown because there's definitely been a shift in the last few months to, to online commerce, which again is a huge opportunity for publishers in the space um, to partner, align, look at different models along that way. Then in terms of money and market, look, and I won't pretend that the ad market hasn't had its challenges, I guess recently, but over the last couple of years, and some of that's been a shift in, in spend due to structural changes. Some has just been a lower confidence in the ad market in Australia overall. Um, but looking, this is the calendar year data. We're actually coming out with the financial year data on uh, Monday, which will detail sort of the um, challenging uh, June quarter in detail, but for the last calendar year, so a $9.3 billion market. So digital makes up about 65% of the total ad market. And you can see within that, you know, a couple of really strong growth areas. So video for the last couple of years has been the, the standout format in terms of driving extra revenue. That shift to mobile consumption is still growing the mobile dollars quite strongly. And there's some really interesting things that we haven't got accurate data for yet, but are coming up and we see some really strong indications for podcast revenue growing, streaming audio, um, and, and, and a number of other formats, which Corinne's going to go through some details on opportunities that are there in market. So that's a really quick overview of the market. Um, please let us know if you've got other questions um, in terms of the shape and form. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to Corinne and then I'll be back to help sort of drive some of the panels. You're on mute still, Corinne. I'm just unmuting yeah. myself. There we are. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm just going to try and share my screen from here uh, to the PowerPoint. Here we go. Is that showing up? Um, it's taking a while. I'll give it one more try. And PowerPoint, here we go. Share screen. How's that? Yep. Excellent. Go into slideshow. Yep. Everything's so slow. Look, we have loads to get through today. So I think I'm just going to crack on and um, hopefully you'll be able to see everything that's on this screen. Um, so what I wanted to quickly go through was some revenue models for publishers. Um, this is really the product of research and reading from, from my part. I'm not from an advertising or revenue expertise background. Um, and I have been trying to think how to advise some of the clients that I work with when they transition to digital innovation or a new platform or a new tool um, to think about monetizing it. 
So that's just a little bit about me. Most of the work I was doing pre-COVID was overseas, um, mostly working with newsrooms, a bit of work with NGOs, um, looking at innovation and implementation. Um, and that's uh, a group of people from Vietnam. So I think one of the things to emphasize in this session is that the challenges for media outlets and also for advertisers are global at the moment and everyone's looking for the same kind of answers. So this is how it kind of feels at the moment, um, that both journalism and advertising are in a bit of a perfect storm at the moment. Um, some of the business model fundamentals have been a problem for journalism for a very long time and similarly for advertising agencies. Um, and COVID has just made it a lot worse for everybody. Um, this is what we were kind of hoping we would find. So perhaps a single silver bullet. Um, and quite often we hear over the last five years or so, is this going to be the answer to our problem? Is this going to be the answer to the problem? And so we had pivot to video and we've had big questions around how, how can we monetize podcasts, for example. Um, but it isn't a single holy grail. It's um, more of a treasure test, I think. Um, that there are lots of different ways of monetizing publishing. Um, and there won't be a one size fits all solution for everybody. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of these quickly to this morning. And I'll just emphasize that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, really the question, um, how can we make money is more a question of what can we sell? And that answer is going to be different for everybody. So advertising is print and there's also digital. And I'm not going to go into that now because we've got some brilliant people on this call who I really want to kind of skip through my slides so that we can hear from them. Um, there are ways of advertising that bring strength even to small uh, publishers, so that might be joining an advertising network. Uh, here in Australia, we've got Regional Media Connect. And we already have an example of that in the podcast world of joining podcast networks so that you can leverage more income by joining up with other shows that are a bit like you. Um, I just want to mention that I have a pinned tweet of readings and resources that have informed this slide deck, including this terrific resource from Digiday. It's a few years old now, but it still, I think, holds up. Um, which is the WTF Advertising Formats Guide. So it's a bit of a dummies guide to different kinds of advertising and how they work. We have branded content. So that's forms of native advertising. And I think it's important to mention here that even the most trusted sources of journalism have branched into branded content. So that includes The Guardian, uh, New York Times, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, The Washington Post and Gimlet. So this idea of working with brands to come up with content that is a win-win-win for the audience, for you and for the brand um, has been a very strong earner um, and can really bring, I think, new sources of income, particularly for niche publishers that may not necessarily sit on the first five pages if we think about the newspaper um, as an analogy, but would sit further back in different sections of a paper like motoring or beauty. E-commerce, Gay mentioned uh, the expansion into e-commerce. Um, the recent Asian Media Leaders Summit that was organized by the World Association of Newspapers Asia office, 75% uh, of members want to branch into e-commerce in the next 12 months. And the biggest barrier to that is having the skill sets. So I think that's something for journalists and organizations like the IAB to think about how do we upskill people to do the product thinking that will allow us to develop both in-house products like software and apps or archives or merch, um, renting out space or studios that we have, but also building relationships with brands to identify the kinds of products that we can um, work together to bring an, an income in. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I suppose this idea of money is a sort of a, a thing that we don't really associate with terribly much in publishing. But then if you think about regional publishing, um, building those affiliate relationships with local businesses, local government, local charities, um, that really does provide journalism as service to your audience. I think that's, that sort of sits in a comfort zone that, that would work for a lot of small and niche publishers. Um, then, of course, there's products, but there's also services. So what are the sorts of things that we do um, in-house that we might be able to offer as a service externally? Um, these are all, everything in this deck are examples of products or services that people are actually selling right now. 
Um, so it might be working with people to develop apps or design a website or host a website or write reports, um, edit content, offering your printing services, doing translations, providing training, um, delivering market research and offering guest speakers and event MCs. These are all little ways, um, even for a regional publisher, that can generate income alongside the sorts of things that we're hearing um, from the big brands like subscriptions. Coming to subscriptions, there are multiple types of subscriptions. So there's print, obviously, that's a form of subscription. Digital, which is um, sitting within a range of, I guess, broad buckets, and then there are variations within this. So pay what you can, freemium, metered, dynamic, and hard. Um, and of course, subscription products. So products that aren't necessarily journalism related or even media related. Um, that you can offer as a subscription um, product. So for example, the New York Times has a crossword subscription. Um, okay, so treating your subscribers as members, um, that can, res I guess if you think about the branded content, but then also working with brands to develop um, products that will give your members something special. So ticket discounts, clubs, um, opportunities to go on tours and holidays, regional produce, regional tourism, etc. Um, but also meetings with journalists, exclusive content and early access to content are also being explored at the moment. Um, Tortoise, for example, is a recently launched media outlet and they open up a weekly meeting to their journalists, to their members, and they're called Think-Ins. Um, sponsorships and partnerships. Um, again, it's thinking, what is it that would bring value to both the audience and also to a brand. So sponsorships can um, work for specific things like events, newsletters, specific verticals. So for example, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization sponsors a food vertical um, on the Thomson Reuters Foundation website. Um, it can work for specific reporter beats, uh, podcast mentions, podcast shows, live streams, jobs boards, digital newsstands, um, and then also partnering with the audience. Um, this is quite an interesting example I came across. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but anyway, um, it's a bit like pyramid selling. So Pop Sugar, which is a, young ma a magazine for young women, um, will partner up with its audience to sell products. And then there are also community forums. So you might run a Slack channel. So the Boston Globe, for example, has a Slack channel that's sponsored um, and also special interest groups and spaces. Um, events, very big. I think this year has been a really interesting foray into online events. So you can run events for free. Um, free doesn't necessarily mean free, that you might capture information about the participants that you can then work with those people. Um, and then also paid for. So the South China Morning Post is going quite big on paid for events um, around things on education, real estate. Uh, they've got a, a law one on at the moment. Um, and big business. The thing about online events is that they're cheaper to run than face-to-face -face, and they attract non-traditional sponsors and you've also got access to a global audience. So there are quite a lot of ways of generating income from events um, and those, those ways and avenues have shifted a bit this year. So it's a really useful time to look at who's running ticketed events and see whether you could um, replicate the same. Um, philanthropic report, uh, support takes kind of two forms. So there's funding, um, so Patreon, I should change the spelling there, tip jar, uh, crowdfunded stories. Legacies is an interesting one. So NPR Radio, for example, is looking at legacies and then straight out donations. Then there's also in-kind philanthropic support and that can take the form, particularly if you think about a smaller town or a region, um, office space and equipment, transport and expertise and skills. So I've got two examples here. Um, one's from Colorado Public Radio on the right. So you've got the, the opportunity to become a member, a sponsor, but you can also donate your car, um, donate space or volunteer. And then on the left, uh, that's a Guardian clipping um, about the Barrier Daily Truth, which was um, rescued from closure by a local business person who realised that what they really needed to stay open um, was a business management plan. So he provided that. Lastly, donor funding. So you've got two kinds of avenues here. The first is a direct pitch from your outlet for funding. And some of the funders are listed there. Uh, the top three are Australian and then the ones below that are international. 
Um, and sometimes you're not eligible for a fund. So for example, if uh, the fund requires grantees to be non-profits or to have an in-country office, then the field that I work in, media development, a lot of um, that involves finding a partner um, that is eligible and then putting in a bid with them. Uh, it's never great to put all your eggs in one basket. So having multiple income sources reduces risk. Can you do that as a small or, or niche outlet? And the answer is yes. I'd love you to take a look at City Dog, which is a magazine, digital magazine for young people um, in Belarus, uh, interesting country at the moment. And they have at least eight sources of income sitting across multiple ways of getting advertising, branded content, brand partnerships, they produce city guides and they run content services. Um, so their editor, Ivana, is just an absolute force of nature. Um, so strongly recommend having a look at that. And I've propped a link to that in a Google Doc, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so get smart. Have a think about income sources and assess them. Is this going to be good for us? Should we pivot to video? Should we go into podcasting? Benchmark what will good look like? How would we know if it had worked or it hadn't? And what would we do next? Um, have a look at what SMART goals are and set those. And then you can, you're in good shape then to pilot for a specific time and then you can reassess and decide that's the moment to scale up or pull the plug. There are courses available. So there are graduate certificates around. There's also Google News Initiative, Knight Foundation. Um, I've just come across a new series of courses that's being run by an organization called FIP. Um, conferences, newsletters, and, and Twitter accounts. It is a lot to keep across. Um, I tweet regularly everything I find and I use a hashtag called JournBiz. So if you look at, at content with that hashtag, you'll see some of the um, materials that I've come across. I'd love us to share what we learn a bit better. Um, I'm loving this webinar. I think capturing and then sharing internally and externally um, is really important and I don't feel that's something that we've nailed as a publishing industry as yet. Um, I've got a Google Doc for this session. Um, it's pinned to a tweet. Uh, as I mentioned, there's JournBiz and then of course you're very welcome to um, contact me anytime and happy to help. And that's it. Thank you so much, Corinne. That was amazing. Um, I feel like I need to go off and start a business now. <laughs> um, we're going to bring it back home to the ad side of things. I think it's interesting to always think about the imbalance with other revenue streams because there's often trade-offs. So um, can I welcome Simon, Amy and Ben to um, unmute and pop their cameras on and we, we can have a bit of a chat. Um, right. So welcome, guys. Um, now, you all run quite different businesses, but the thing you have in common is you work with a lot of um, publishers, you know, large, medium, new, emerging, etc. I'd love just to kick off with if each of you could just give us a, I guess, a few tips on from your experience of working with publishers um, on how they can make the most of I guess technology and working with partners to, to drive revenue. Um, ben, do you want to kick off? Yeah, um, basically it's probably good to sort of like take a look at the ad models, um, the ad models that I particularly had experience with. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a wide ranging, uh, uh, there's wide ranging models. There's the affiliate, um, there's basically the one that probably everyone knows traditionally is ad funded display. Classifieds, um, obviously a lot of news services do a hybrid model of uh, subscription and advertising. And then there's bodies that we've worked with that purely uh, work in sponsorships. So I'll just take a look at each of them in detail. So the affiliate, traditionally, um, uh, we've actually worked with horse racing publications who um, do this very, very well. And as traditionally that model works where they um, you know, put wagerers on the actual site and they drive sign-ups and basically share in the profit losses <laughs> accrued by the punter. So that actually takes time to build up for it to be sort of like, you know, profitable. Classifieds, you know, there's, there's many options out there, you know, many examples of B2C sites like, you know, Gumtree uh, and the like uh, that actually offer, you know, a classified model. 
Uh, hybrid, as I've mentioned, uh, a lot of news publications uh, do this with subscription-based services um, and sponsorships. Traditionally, in my experience, we've uh, you know worked with um, you know bodies in the past, the Australian Motor Group. Um, also, as well, we've worked with sporting bodies who basically expand on their sort of um, you know their sponsorship partners, uh, who and and they basically operate say you know, five, six, seven advertisers on a sort of share of voice rotation. So giving them, you know, 20% of inventory on the actual site. But let's just take a look at the ad funded model. And for a lot of the actual small publishers on this actual uh, call, um, you know, uh, if you actually take a programmatic approach, um, there's not a lot of margin in that for, you know, um, publishers who don't have large inventory volumes basically is you know we've had to manage quite a few expectations with publishers that we've worked in in, in the past whose expectations have far exceeded what volume that they have to work with so what i'd actually advise to sort of like niche and small publishers small publishers on this is to have a, have a look at the alternate methods of actually you know utilizing advertising fill have a direct strategy in place if you do need to sort of like you know fill uh, your inventory, you know, uh, look at sort of like, a, you know, a basic setup to start off with. That would be, you know, one of my first practical, uh, 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 th that would be the advice that I would actually give, um, straight, you know, straight off the bat. Basically, you know, take a look at the actual models that I've actually just outlined and see what actually best fits uh, your publication. You, there might be actually multiple. You might look at sponsorships for certain sections. You might look at subscription models. You might have ad funded models. So, you know, it's important to note that not no one publisher is the same and no one solution uh, is the same either. Great. Thanks, Ben. Amy, I know you're dealing with a lot of interesting publishers at the moment. How any tips? Yeah, so my, my kind of quick top line tip would be if this is not your area of specialty, um, get some independent advice to help you look at what your assets are, what the opportunities might be, um, what the revenue potential is, and then what a roadmap would look like, which realistically would need to be staggered and is going to have to go hand in hand with what your content strategy is, you know, if you've got marketing plans or you need to increase audience, because it's it's a fine line and I think we'll go through it in more detail as we get into the questions, but this whole balance, for net, particularly for niche publishers, between quality content, volume and advertising revenue um, is all needs to kind of tie together. So I would say um, if you don't have anyone in house who specialises in this, um, there, there are some consultancies around that will, will help you do that. Um, but, but get some independent advice to help you shape that roadmap and then start engaging with partners that will help you um, fill out that plan along the way. Because we do make things as complicated as possible in our industry, Amy, you're right. So, <laughs> Simon, how about you? So I'm with you, Gay. We do make things very complicated. I think um, my advice is keep it as simple as possible. There are there are so many, you know, lingo about advertising technology. Um, before I was in the advertising technology game, I had my own niche magazine. I ran a, a magazine in London for Aussies. It was very small. We had a website that attracted a very engaged um, and very active audience, but it was very small, you know. Um, there was no programmatic back then. It was sort of 2004 to 2009. It had just started. Google AdSense was around. We never, ever plugged anything like that into the platform because the amount of revenue that you would generate would be minimal. So we, we were very, you know, we had a lot of direct relationships. Like I'm guessing that, that, that most of the niche new publishers do have. And we did a lot of direct um, sales. Um, we didn't, I mean, it was a lot simpler then, but I, but I don't think the theory should change now. I think, I think you should uh, own, own your clients. You should have lots of direct deals. You should use technology that's very simple to use. Programmatic RTB these days is so complicated. You need a degree to work how to use it, right? And, 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 and like Amy said, unless you've got an ad ops team or, or, or someone in house, you're really pissing in the wind basically, unless, unless you, you, you yourself are an expert. Um, I'd, I'd look at some of the, the commercial models that Corrine 
has suggested um, simple things like most like regional. I work with a lot of regional titles, right? They've got very engaged audiences um, and, and, and they're very loyal readers of their papers, you know, build a newsletter, you know, communicate with newsletters, run competitions for some of your, your local businesses and then share data. Um, yeah, banner advertising, sure, run that. Find the best way to get the, the highest CPMs, the highest yields you can get. But, 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 um, but it's not the only way to generate revenue. Um, and, and events are great, you know. Um, um, just, just think outside the box, but keep, box but, but, but keep it really, really simple. Great, thanks, Simon. So I guess that a lot of that talks to um, the importance of audience building. And I might just shuffle the questions around a bit because I think this talks to one of the questions I had for you, Amy, around sort of metrics and audience and how to how to really package up what you what you're offering. Um, what would you suggest in terms of what metrics, what data, what what can smaller publishers make available to their advertising clients? So really it's, um, it comes, it will, it will always come back to, um, to what you can deliver back to an advertiser. So what people are looking for um, is generally um, looking at, um, you know, aside from the context, it all, it's all about your audience and the engagement of that audience. So um, you need to be able to articulate critical information about your audience. So demographic, location, engagement, um, things like average time per visit, pages, um, having a low bounce rate is also really important. We've seen with, with a few niche publishers recently that um, they're trying to kind of amplify audience and, and get people there, but they're using uh, some headlines and things that aren't necessarily backing up the content for when people go there. So then the bounce rate will be really high. So um, all of those things um, will impact, obviously, then, you know, you, you might get some impressions coming up, but it, it will impact the response of that advertising and you'll end up with a whole lot of one-time advertisers. Um, so um, for standard display, um, if your volumes are low, you, you probably won't be able to target by audience, um, but you still need to be able to tell the story about your audience um, and, and whether that's based on content, um, on the content segments or, or sponsorships you're selling. Um, and then it will also come down to what you can actually target on the site. So we find with some kind of smaller publishers that um, they've been set up in a really rudimentary way so that they can only do, you know, sort of run of site advertising. And sometimes your sections might be small and not support, you know, selling lots of individual sponsorships. But um, I think really it's looking at, um, you know, whether you've got something in place like, you know, the free version of Google Analytics, trying to extract as much information as you can out of platforms like that and, you know, tools where, you know, they, they'll need to be cost effective, at least at the starting point, but will help you actually build a story and a value proposition. Um, from a metrics perspective, the other thing that is, is probably the most important thing that's, that's really come to the fore in the last, probably the last 18 months or so, um, is viewability. So, um, we are, that, that's now a standard inclusion across all direct um, and programmatic buyers. Um, the industry benchmark for that is 70%, but most buyers are upsetting 90 to 100% um, expectations on that. So that means that if you're selling a sponsorship, but your viewable, viewable inventory is low, if you've set a number against that, then the agency or the client will expect that you will just continue that until you've hit whatever the number was, but in, in viewable impressions. So, and that can work against you if you've sold, you know, sort of back-to-back -back sponsorships. So it's something you need to take into account with, um, and your estimates. Um, from a newsletter, so that, that falls probably more traditional display type um, metrics. Um, newsletters can't really be facilitated through standard ad servers, you know, from a display ad perspective, unless you've got another solution in place, like a power inbox or something that will let you del deliver ads into newsletters. So most people um, manage those as kind of sponsored um, newsletter, um, either content or, or as a solace. Um, and that will really come back to, you know, what other metrics your email platform can provide. So, um, you know, things like numbers of subscribers, bounce rates, opens, um, click or action um, that has come out of that and generally within about a seven day window. Um, 
from an app and a podcast perspective, we sort of treat that quite differently. And, and I would say like, you know, from a, from a business that is solely dedicated to ad ops and ad tech, we don't really touch that. So I would say get a specialist to help you with that. It's, it, it just is worked completely differently from, from a um, demand partner perspective, as well as the different monetization models. Um, podcasts, where people are monetizing them because they're quite deli- difficult to deliver traditional ads into from an audio perspective. Most people are using a third party um, partner for that. So, you know, something like a Triton Digital, um, a Rubicon, um, Google's Ad Exchange will have audio ads you'll be able to plug into podcasts down the track. So, um, but, but they will still revolve on engagement um, just like the rest of it. Okay, Amy, lots there. And, and I know you're feeding into the handbook, so... Um, there's quite a few questions coming through. Might not get to all of them, but hopefully we'll answer quite a lot of them in the in the handbook. Um, I might get Ben and Simon just quickly to to add anything onto that, and then we're we're going to go up to the publishers publishers panel. Um, but we'll definitely get back to all these questions. Ben, anything to add to Amy? I know you deal with publishers that have quite different business models, as you've sort of pointed out. Anything else from a metrics or audience point of view that tips for the audience? Um, more from a sort of tech perspective, really, we, we sort of, um, you know, um, for, for people that are on this actual call, you know, um, over the last three plus years, we've worked with or reviewed in excess of over 50 tech solutions. And that can range from anything from ad servers, exchanges, supply side platforms, media technology, uh, ad verification measurement, uh, as Amy touched on about viewability, data, video, I could go on and on and on. And it's pretty daunting out there, especially if you're sort of like a small or a niche publication. I mean, who has the bandwidth to actually, you know, review all that? And actually, in addition to that, you've also got solutions that do the same thing. You know, we've probably worked with three or four solutions that actually do the same thing. So it's important, I think, that you get a support support team in place that's highly skilled in this area that can offer you practical advice and the best solution for your business. As, as the panellists have actually talked about, uh, I, I like to refer this as the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, because more often than not, when we are all guilty of this, we overcomplicate what actually should be a very, very simple model. Great, thanks. Um, and for people on the call who aren't sort of familiar with some of the terminology like viewability, there's a really basic document that the IB has put together for, for marketers in mind, but would work as well on the on the, on the sales side called the Australian Digital Advertising Practices that walk, walks through some of the sort of more technical um, issues. I won't use the word issues, but um, challenges and, and things that you need to be across that like an hour read that I would highly recommend that people have a, have a read of. Simon, last word for a quick last word from you. Um, yeah. That's all okay. that we have, I've got a, I've got a solution. I can help people if, if, if you want to get in touch. No, um, ad. no ad, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to help. Get in touch. Yeah. Free. Yeah, great. Now, look, all these three guys are, are really good at understanding um, the landscape, optimising yield, um, and really pragmatic solutions. Some of this can all sound a bit overwhelming, you know, but there are, I guess, you know, pick the revenue streams that you think will work for your audience and, and work with the partners who really understand those. So thank you all. Um, we'll hopefully get back to you at the end, but um, we're going to hand over to the, um, to the publisher panel now. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Ben. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Stephanie and Mike, are you inspired by all of that or are you going to go to another profession now? Totally inspired. <laughs> It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> um, I might get you quickly, just each of you to sort of talk through, I guess, your business and your, your revenue models. And I guess any revenue models that you've just given up on because they're too hard would be interesting for the audience as well. And those that have probably been a, a pleasant surprise would be nice as well. Stephanie, I don't know if you want to kick off. Yeah, I'll kick off. Um, so, look, Rainmaker Group is a fully integrated data research events and media business that owns the full suite of our publications across the B2B wealth management and B2C personal finance space. Um, The scope of these titles is expanding rapidly under the Rainmaker Group banner, um, but they do include Financial Standard, which is our hero masthead, and the one that I'll be focusing on today for the purposes of this discussion. 
In terms of our revenue models, our financial standard does operate on a 100% share of voice fixed sponsorship digital buy across both our website and e-newsletter environments. Um, across the scope of those environments, we do offer to advertisers a series of IAB compliant uh, brand awareness and thought leadership style options um, that they can choose to speak to us about at any time. I think what's really important is that Financial Standard absolutely does not sell media on a CPC, a CPM um, or cost per lead model at all. And the reason why we don't is because those methodologies actually don't make sense in the context of what our advertisers are looking to achieve when they engage Financial Standard. Um, to be very clear, our advertisers are really looking to tap into the 22,000 financial advisors in Australia and the 200 super funds and multi-managers in the country. As you can imagine, this is a niche uh, space within Australian wealth management. Um, so seeking millions and millions of eyeballs and a multitude of impressions um, really just isn't relevant uh, to what our advertisers are looking to achieve. Mike, do you want to give us a bit of a feel of, of, of your business and business model? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Mike from Star News Group, uh, we are a uh, publisher. Uh, we publish uh, 30, 40 um, different publications, either monthly or weeklies, newspapers and magazines. For all of those, we have a corollary uh, online web presences uh, as well. We're strong in social media and, um, you know, all the pieces of technology that um, are required in that. So, uh, and yeah, as uh, as mentioned earlier, we, we have started to expand into Queensland. We had a little bit of a footprint up there already, but um, more recently, uh, I can't believe in a pandemic we're expanding, but I used to say um, we should really only expand into markets where we can drive to it uh, because then we can go to the office and we can meet with the people. But then we, now we're not allowed to drive anywhere. And then I used to say, oh, we'll, we'll fly there then. So anywhere we can open where we can fly, but then now we can't fly there either. So uh, we can't drive, we can't fly. All we've got now is video conference. So really we can open in any market now, anywhere where somebody's uh, internet uh, connected. And, and that's really what we've been doing more recently in, in Queensland. So um, that's kind of the, the introduction of, um, of what we do. Um, we're really in the community news and information space. And in terms of uh, ad revenues or, or revenues in total, we're probably 95% supported by advertising revenue. And the other 5% would be a mix of uh, subscription. Um, primarily, most of our products are uh, free distribution to communities. And um, yeah, we drive newsrooms with uh, journalists. So that's um, a big part of our business is creating content. That's my overview. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Now, Will, I think you're almost on the, on the flip side in terms of business models. Yeah, so we, um, we have three main brands. Um, so our flagship brand is Crikey. Uh, Crikey is a news website that's 100% or essentially 100% uh, uh, reader funded and um, subscription funded. Um, we run ads occasionally. Um, but yeah, that is a sort of pure play subscription product. Um, and that's about uh, in revenue terms about half our business. Um, uh, after that, we have a brand called The Mandarin, which is for public sector workers. Um, and until a year ago, that was 100% advertising. Um, a year ago, we launched a premium product. Um, and then that premium revenue now constitutes about 35% of the total revenue. Um, and that's not because advertising has come down, that's um, kind of growth revenue. Um, and then our third brand is a company called Smart Company, or a brand called Smart Company. Uh, Smart Company is for small business owners and people who work in the SME industry. Um, and that is, uh, essentially 100% advertising funded, though we are in the process of launching a, um, a sort of reader revenue subscription product. Um, so as a business as a whole, um, uh, two years ago, we probably would have been about 70, 30 uh, advertising to reader revenue or subscription revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're not quite the sort of reverse, but we're now about 60% reader revenue uh, and about 40% advertising. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Steph, I might come back to you in terms of, we, we talked a little bit with Amy, Ben and, and Simon around sort of that audience and, and need to stand out and position your, your, your you know, your offering in an audience sense. What, what's your sort of approach to 
giving giving the metrics you've talked a little bit about your model but how do you how do you position the success for your advertisers um i definitely think that in our specific very niche category um, it's really the integrity of the audience data that our advertisers are seeking from us so to be very clear within the wealth management category that audience can be segmented even further into planners, institutional investors, um, high net worths and family offices and managed accounts providers. And I think really being able to articulate to our advertisers how we can actually target those people and what our penetration into those particular, particular categories are from both an audience, um, editorial and data set point of view is crucial to getting a successful sales outcome across the line. Um, further to your question as well, I think when we are selling to clients, it's really important to understand that they are looking for statistical and evidence-based data to support any recommendations that we make to them across the scope of the sales cycle. Um, and importantly as well, uh, internal and external readership surveys pertaining to the wealth management segment more broadly um, are really something that our advertisers are looking for when they're potentially looking to part with sort of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and give financial standard that share of the pie. Great. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one looking at that sort of, you know, third party or your own surveys. And um, I think you've got to be particularly on your own site, really careful. It's great to gather your own audience data if you're, if you're not a logged in site, but I guess treating them with respect and, um, keeping them nice and short and sharp. Um, Mike, you've, you've been around the industry for a while. Um, the IAB sort of played, you know, mainly in the, in the big end of town and, and most, a lot of industry bodies. What help, I guess, can the industry give new publishers? And more importantly, I guess, when should we just stay out of the way so people can innovate and get on with things? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, you know, we, at our level, um, we probably, uh, you know, I've been to the odd IAB event. Uh, I'm aware of IAB uh, uh, since the beginning of IAB time. And um, we have used it more as uh, the guidepost for what are, and we're appreciative of what setting, the policy setting, the standards that have been set uh, universally through IAB. So we relied on it more as a resource uh, to be able to read and understand and to, to build our knowledge uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, obviously in terms of online um, advertising and display options and um, really just helping to guide us in that way. Um, you know, beyond that, we, we haven't had a lot of um, IAB um, engagement. Um, uh, well, you know, what I will just say, too, is uh, in terms of the kinds of products that we offer um, our customers and our audience, uh, you know, primarily our customers are advertisers. So absolutely, we offer uh, display advertising through through print and online. Uh, we have uh, paywalls on a number of our sites, and particularly all of our new uh, Queensland operations have paywalls on them. And, um, yeah, we're doing all the kinds of things, not all of them, but a lot of the things that Corinne was uh uh, mentioning earlier, we're not really into events, but absolutely um, doing integrated um, and, and branded content, uh, native posts, uh, EDMs, uh, competitions, digital marketing, um, subscriptions. You know, we think it's funny. People talk about pivoting. Um, we largely, because we're free publications, don't do home delivery. But in Queensland, all the new markets we've launched into, which are uh, uh, Kingaroy, Gympie, um, Rockhampton and Bundaberg, uh, these will are, are developing and will all have home delivery. So that's our Uber uh, pivot. We've gone to home delivery of newspapers. So, and that has actually been a, an amazing response from our audience. Uh, it, you know, just to give you some perspective, when we launched our one of our first websites for one of these new uh, initiatives, we had online subscribers within an hour. So there was absolutely a great desire uh, for local relevant contents in these new markets that we're, we're um, expanding into. And these are primarily markets where uh, News Corp is exiting out of the uh, market, but you can still see there's a significant demand uh, from the audience and also from advertisers to have some kind of channel. Um, so that's really the niche we're trying to fill. And um, yeah, so we're doing all of the kinds of typical things that you'd expect to do. And, and I think the reason we're able to do this is because we have a long history and the ability to 
uh, utilize what would be sort of our centralized uh, production services, um, our creative services, our accounting services, our IT services. So um, as we launch these, the, the, the infrastructure is in place for us to do that. Um, so that's a bit of a long-winded answer to uh, how has IAB helped. But uh, <laughs> well, I, all I can just say is it's it's been a great benefit for me because that's often me working in a bit of a vacuum and not having a lot of external discussions with other publishers or with with online people is IAB has always been something um, there that I could use as a as a resource so and I would absolutely say to anybody if you haven't really been to the IAB website is to visit it and take advantage like this webinar to all the knowledge base that exists. Thanks Mike I wasn't looking for a plug but thank you thank you anyway that's, that's, true. <laughs> that's great. It's true. Um, well, you know, you talked about sort of, I guess, the, the revenue models changing for you guys over time. How do you assess that balance? At, at what point do you, you know, you've got, you've got paying people, uh, particularly for premium products, as well as, you know, a certain amount of advertising there. How, how do you assess that trade off between the different revenue models or do you just launch and see where it lands? Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, the way I would think about it is, uh, I think it is a, an interesting tension between diversification and focus. Um, so um, diversification is important. Like I have worked for uh, companies that have just had ad revenue before or had ad revenue from one particular source um, and have experienced rapid growth. Um, but you look at the P&L and revenue is just so incredibly lumpy that as, as someone who's running the business, it's very hard to kind of plan or invest you don't know what month to month is going to look like. Um, so diversification is important um, because it helps you spread that out, hopefully make the revenue less lumpy. Um, and when you're small, um, having multiple revenue streams can help because hopefully each of them is kind of incremental and helps you grow the business. Um, that said, I, I do think there is a, a, a tension there between um, sort of exploring opportunities and not losing focus. Um, so as an example, at the beginning of this year, uh, we were very um, focused on trying to grow all the different revenue streams we have. So across the three brands, each brand has got sort of three or four different streams. Um, and it became apparent very quickly that the team didn't know what was the most important one or what was the top three most important. Um, and so it was very hard it felt like we were growing in some senses in that we were growing more revenue streams, but we weren't necessarily growing the top or bottom line. Um, uh, in my experience, um, most media organizations um, probably under cost uh, revenue exploration. Um, they uh, fail. There seems to be an interesting trait, particularly amongst entrepreneurs, sort of want to do more and want to take on more and want to explore more and not always being completely honest about the amount of work that's going to have to go into that exploration. Um, and even if it is successful, being honest about the amount of work we'll have to go into to managing that new stream. Um, so uh, uh, I don't know if it's um, sort of a, a point in answer. I think it's a, a tough one. Um, and obviously new revenue streams should be explored. Uh, but if I was to give a recommendation, I would just say, um, uh, bear in mind that the, the temptation will always be to undercost um, the, the the kind of reality of pursuing that. Yeah. Um, Karina, I might bring you in at this point. Um, there's been a, an interesting question. I guess we could talk for hours on this one, but as I guess the types of advertising that have come into play are less, I guess, segmented away from the editorial and there's more sort of blended models. Have you seen locally or globally much of an impact on editorial? How, 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 do, we, how do we keep that balance right? I think as long as they are very clearly separate, both to the brand and also to your audience. Um, you know, the, this, the field of branded content, which is a very broad church, um, is there are a lot of um, you know highly trusted media outlets um, worshiping there now, and so I don't I feel like we can just let that go and join the congregation, right? Um, it's so important to maintain public trust, but I think we also see, particularly, you know, with the volume of misinformation and disinformation at the moment, that media outlets offer something that has a high cash value, which is trust, right? 
Yep. So if it's communicated clearly and it's very kept very, very separate um, from the point of view of both the brand and the consumer, um, then it's, it's, you know, really sensible to, to pursue. I think there is a concern um, that brands might influence um, editorial policy um, and, you know, individual organisations have to take a decision on that. At a certain point, you switch out from being a, a journalism outlet um, and into a B2B or B2C outlet right and there's an example in Finland of a magazine that took exactly that decision they've decided that they weren't going to do journalism anymore and they were going to become a b2b business um, but I don't think that it's not an either or choice mm -hmm. um, you just do need to set up spaces and platforms where your your content uh, your branded content can be um, mm. consumed and that and when it's clearly marked it works better for both sides actually trust trust on the advertiser and the consumer yeah. stephanie you guys do a, a bit in the branded content space in terms of question came through in terms of charging how do you price branded content so i'm going to begin by saying uh, that i'm coming at this from purely a commercial point of view obviously being a sales director um, but also um, i do want to say that i agree with the sentiments that we've seen across the scope of this panel which is really to keep it simple. And I think uh, with niche publishers, that's certainly what we do try to do when we're looking at putting together pricing models. Um, I look at two things, performance and demand um, when it comes to content-led executions. And certainly for us, from a financial standard point of view, our content-led assets sell out roughly four to five months in advance. So if you're actually looking at, you know, simply just the demand for content-led and thought-led executions, um, you know, that in itself demands a premium um, because, you know, there are numerous advertisers fighting for the same inventory, you know, within your publication. Um, and then, of course, we do track the performance, um, you know, from a dwell time, open rate, um, CTR, video view style perspective, and look at, you know, what is that really worth? you know, when we're putting together, you know, a rate card versus an offer rate style scenario. Great. Thanks for that. Um, look, we're coming to the end of time. We've got a million more questions. I might just get Simon, Amy and Bender to come back on because uh, we're going to have to close up in a sec. Um, can I get a three word answer from each of you? Yeah. And I'll, and I'll st on, um, the thing that you're most excited about, let's leave on a positive note in terms of, I guess, the market over the next year or two or the launch of new publications, just a really quick response. And we're probably going to run a minute or two over, so hopefully people can, can hang out and stay with us a bit. Will, you're, you're top of my list there. Are you ready? What are you most three, excited three about? Words. Three words or one sentence. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'd probably say scaled reader revenue. Great. Right. Thanks. Stephanie? New digital assets. Great. Mike? Yeah, I'm going to give you six words. I'd say this is advice. Create a relationship with your clients. That's vital. Nice. Ben? High impact solutions. Amy? I would say actually the opportunity for niche publishers has, has never been greater and we're seeing much more demand for this type of content from an advertiser perspective than ever before. Sorry, that was about 50, but I'm out. <laughs> That's great. That's positive. Simon. Um, focus on direct demand because it is way bigger than, than, than the demand that comes from agencies. Um, and I think it suits niche publishers better. Right. And Corinne, you're excited about everything, but what are you most excited about? <laughs> I'm most excited about the fact that more publishers are asking at the beginning of an innovation, how can I monetize this? And that gives me hope that journalism can be monetized. Let's say the journalistic endeavor rather than necessarily journalism. And I think we're understanding that those two things are not the same. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. Um, next week, we've got something slightly different, uh, but still focused on obviously advertising in the media industry. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen. So we're going into the uh, travel world next week. Um, so we're going to be looking at, which I know does seem like odd timing, but we're going to look at how um, travel and tourism brands are really um, 
um, you can shoot me if we're using the word pivoting, but um, making sure that they're keeping the lights on, talking to their consumers, looking at innovative ways to um, work within a, a challenging environment. For those who joined us last week, we saw a really interesting example from Tour Tourism New Zealand, who worked with Twitch to do Play NZ, which is a really cool way of keeping people excited about the, the brand of New Zealand and, and ready to visit when they can visit. Um, next, next week, we're going to hear from South Australian Tourism, um, as well as a few case studies from a, a few different IAB partners. So hopefully you can join us for that. There should be a link in the, in the chat box now that you can register. Um, so that is exciting. The other thing I would point out to a few of the, um, the media owners on side, we've just launched a research awards program. So we have an annual conference called Measure Up, which focuses on media measurement and ad effectiveness. Um, this year to add a bit of bit of light and a bit of celebration to the market where we're launching an awards program, it's free to enter. It is looking at great research coming from media owners, tech partners, um, who are sort of really, you know, trying to help explain consumer trends, societal trends, information on how you, they're using data in market. Um, that will be judged by a, um, a panel of very senior media agency people um, who'll be looking at it. So it's really open to all. So we're really looking at sort of people who might have run something in-house as a research piece, externally through a partner, all of it. So we really want to lift the quality of research that's out there and, and celebrate really good information that can help advertisers and agencies get excited about investing. So. Um, please, please put some entries in there and we'll review them. I'd love to see some small guys as well as, as well as big guys who um, have, have deeper pockets to invest in this sort of thing. So thank you for everyone joining us today. Hopefully it was useful. We will send a link with the recording um, as well as when the, the handbook is published with all those resources. And um, as you would have seen, Corinne's got um, a huge list of resources there that are available. Please feel free to look at those and add to those as well. And, Let's keep um, sharing and, and learning. Thank you, everyone. Take Thanks care. So. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.